Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Octopus Builds. My name is Bob Walker and I am the Technical Director of Customer Success and I am building out the fictional Trident project for the sample company Octo Pet Shop. In this series I'm taking on the role of a DevOps engineer who is helping a team of developers, the Trident team, build out their new application. In the previous episode um, we configured our deployment process to deploy the first website package that's out there as well as configure an email notification step. Now I want to do kind of a redo on one of those steps which is the send an email step. I'm not super happy about the fact that I have my name hard-coded in this step like this especially when I have the capability to push it out to teams. So I'm going to call this one of those happy little accidents and let's go ahead and get this all changed up before we move on to the main meat of this episode. So I'm going to come into my teams and I'm going to create a new team. I'm going to call this my Trident notification. Yeah, let's call it that. I'm going to make this accessible in this particular space only. If I made it accessible in all spaces, that means it's a system team. Anyone could take advantage of it. But, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that. So let's just create this team. And I'm actually going to add a brief description so everyone knows the whole point of it. Uh, team. As easy as that. All right. So I'm not going to add any sort of user roles. All I'm going to do is I'm going to add myself as a member. Let's go ahead and add myself and save this. Awesome. So yeah, this, this team is just used for notifications. As we get into later uh, episodes, I'll start talking about how to start restricting, restricting permissions based on different user roles. Uh, but for now, we just need to have a notification team. So let's jump back into our process and Let's click on, let's just remove this, and I want to change this to be Trident Notifications, and let's go ahead and save this. Awesome. So now, um, anytime anyone's added to that team, they'll automatically get these notifications. I don't have to go back into the step, constantly re-add it, constantly do anything like that. The nice thing is even um, the team is snapshot but not the team membership. So as the team changes or grows and changes, uh, I think I said that twice, um, they'll automatically get the emails. Uh, so if someone were to say come along in the next release and they were added between going to QA and staging, when we deploy out to staging, they'll get the ability to uh, get those notifications. So it sets us up for future growth, which is great. All right, now let's get into the meat of this episode, which is we're going to be talking a little bit about variables, specifically structured variable or structured configuration variables. So the Trident application, I've pulled it up here, has a pretty basic configuration file at this particular point in time. And we have the ability, we have two kind of sections in our JSON file. We have connection strings and database. And what I want to do is I want to replace this database connection string with an actual connection string, not just blah. That doesn't help anyone. And this is fairly common for a lot of customers. They have a file and they have a database connection string that they need to, to switch up. It is, uh, or it could be uh, an email, an email uh, address, it could be some credentials, whatever the case may be, it's going to differ per environment. And that's one of the great powers of Octopus Deploy is have that ability to have the same kind of configuration but have different variable values. So let's jump in and let's show you how to do all that. So as you as you can see, we have connection strings and then database. So if we look at our documentation, um, and if you come up to here, and if you search for structured configuration variables, you'll get sent to this page. And inside of here, it shows you how to do this type of variable replacement. So what Octopus Deploy will do is, after it finishes uh, extracting out the package, in our case it's a zip file, we can configure it to look for any number of different things. In our particular case, it's going to be our app settings.json file uh, right here, our app settings.json. And we can tell it to replace values. 
So this is very similar to what we have already, but instead of uh, app, it's connection strings. Instead of port, it's database. So our variable name needs to match this syntax. So let's go over to our variable screen. And I want to call this connection strings. I just want to make sure I got it correctly because, yep, let's get case sensitivity just to be sure. Because you never know sometimes. Now, sometimes case sensitivity doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. It's like, why risk it? So in our case, it's connection strings database. And let's enter in a value for this. And I have a sample value all ready to roll. All right. So let's get let's move this out just a bit so we can see this. OK. So there's, there's some concern. If I were just to save this, let's go ahead and just save it right now. So if I were to save this, anybody who has permissions to view this project now can see my user ID and my super secret password, which doesn't really exist. And not only that, the name of the server as well as the name of data, the database. Now, I want this structure to be maintained, but I don't necessarily need to have a different, uh, sorry. I want to make sure that the structure is maintained, but I can piecemeal replace this uh, using the Octostash replacement, which we kind of briefly touched on in our email step. So I'm just going to call this uh, project dot uh, server database server dot name. I'm just going to call it database dot server dot name. Now this is one of the things I like to do within my project is I like to namespace my variables so I know where they're coming from and it also makes it easier for me to remember. Um, so the server name, let's just call this uh, dev server and we can now scope things to environments. So this is one of the really cool things within Octopus Deploy is I can come in here and I can scope these different variables to different environments. I keep, I'm so used to typing in test and not QA, but that's perfectly fine. All right, now we got staging server. And as you can imagine, these aren't real servers. I'm just putting in values for the purposes of this episode and this demonstration. Production server, and you can change that up. Now, let's say that we don't want people to know the name of our any of our servers. Uh, that's a state secret or something like that. We can change the type to sensitive. And what Octopus Deploy will do is once I click the Save button, it's going to encrypt that value. And it will encrypt it, and it will, we can never get it again from this, uh, from this page. So if I were to click Save, which I'm going to do, now, if I were to come in here and I would attempt to edit this value, you can see it just shows up as a blank value. It doesn't have any, it, I can't change it at all. I mean, I can change it, but I can't see the value. Um, so the only time that that value will ever be decrypted is during a deployment. Now, what I want to do is I want to change this to be project.database.server.name. And so what I'm doing here is I'm maintaining the structure of this connection string, but replacing very specific key values for the things that I want to differentiate per environment. And you know, and I'm not going to do this for everything else. I'll probably do that off camera just to show you how it's done. But the whole idea is again, you kind of hopefully you get the whole idea is that you can have variables that are kind of compilation of other variables. And this is something I definitely recommend for. Uh, situations we where you are going in and um, like having a database connection string or if you have to have any sort of credentials or anything like that. Now the nice thing about this is that if I were to need, if I need to say uh, come in here and run another script and I need to get the database server name, the database password, whatever the case may be, I can again just reuse this variable instead of trying to have having to parse it out of this connection string. So again, there's a lot of value in doing something like this. Now, while I'm here, I want to talk a little bit about scoping and how that works within Octopus Deploy. As you can see, we can scope to environments. Uh, we can also scope to target roles, uh, targets, specific deployment steps, which we only have two, as well as channels, which we only have one channel. I would say the most common thing I see pe people using is environments. Uh, with, I would say, target roles and maybe deployment steps coming in as a close second. Uh, 
Now the way that Octopus Deploy handles scoping is whatever is the most specific scope for that uh, that matches those conditions wins. So what do I mean by that? Let's let's go ahead and let's just remove uh, staging from here. So when I deploy to development, Octopus Deploy will see there's actually two variables that match the scope. This variable value and this variable value right here. However, because I'm going to development, it's going to see that this variable value has a scope to the environment I'm about to deploy to, so that's going to win out. However, when I deploy to staging, I don't have any other var variables here uh, that match that scope. I just have this one variable. So it's going to pick that. So whatever is the most specific value is going to be the one that is chosen by Octopus Deploy. Um, I would kind of avoid trying to get super complex with your scoping unless it's absolutely necessary. Most of the time I'd kind of stick to environment differentiators, excuse me, environment scoping. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have some questions as to why is it picking this value. And uh, we have a, a, our documentation explains how it goes through and picks all those things. Um, but whenever, whenever possible, try to avoid uh, having multiple scopes unless it's absolutely necessary. Again, I like just keeping it simple, keep it within the environment itself. All right, so we have created, created our variable that we want to use as well as built out our initial variable name. And let's go ahead and let's change our deployment process to leverage this feature. So I came into my package step and I'm going to go ahead and click on configure features and structure configuration variables. So this says I'm going to replace variables in JSON, YAML, XML, and Java properties files. Um, if you're using a standard .NET framework, a legacy .NET framework application, and you're using uh, config files or you're doing any sort of configuration transforms, that's what these two values are for. Uh, but just for right now, we just need structure configuration variables because this is a .NET 6 application. Now all we have to do is we just have to specify our file and it's just app settings.json and it does this based on the it's relative to the package contents and my package that i have the app settings.json is in the root directory so that's all that's why that's just all i need to do if you have it stored in other directories such as like a config directory um, you would probably you would have to do something like config slash um, or if you wanted to replace everything in it, no matter what, in any JSON file that appears, you can do star.json. But again, I like to keep things very specific as to what I'm going to be doing, and let's just do app settings.json. Alrighty. Well, we've made a couple of changes to our deployment process today, and we have added the structure configuration variables inside of here, as well as we've changed the team. Uh, change this email notification to go from a specific person to a specific team. So let's create a release and verify everything's working together. Again, uh, the reason why we have to create a release is because the deployment process, the variables, uh, as well as the package versions, they were all snapshotted in the previous release. So I'm going to go ahead and click on save because we need to pick up the new changes. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy. So hopefully, fingers crossed, if everything works correctly, we should see it pop through pretty quickly. Now, while we're waiting for this to happen, I kind of want to talk a little bit about this deployment screen because I haven't spent a ton of time on this. Uh, one of the things to take a look at is our task history. It shows you when things happen and who did those actions. So you can see I'm the one who came in here and I was the one who said, hey, go ahead and deploy this release to development. And it shows you exactly when it happened. In addition to that, it tells us what node it ran on. Um, so if you're an Octopus Cloud, you're going to get this kind of like Octopus server nodes and this long string that makes no sense. That's just a, a, a procedurally generated string um, because we're running Octopus Cloud on Kubernetes clusters. And so I could have a completely different node each each time or each day because a new container is running on something like that. In addition to that, it'll show you about uh, artifacts as well as any sort of release notes or anything like that. And I'll get into what artifacts are as well as release notes in upcoming episodes, but I just want to kind of highlight that while we're waiting for this to run. So it's finished running while, we're, while we were talking. 
And again, because I'm just deploying to a cloud region, nothing really was changed, and I sent out an email. So everything is configured as I expect it to be configured. And that's really it for today. So thank you very much for watching. And in the next episode, uh, we're going to be building out this deployment process a little bit more. And we're going to start talking about uh, release artifacts. So I uh, hopefully you uh, found this useful and have a great rest of your day.